Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the work you've been doing in our lives already this morning. Lord, right now we ask that uh, as the, all the various groups are together, you will be doing your work in them, teaching them, helping them to grow, become the very people you want them to be. I pray for us here, Lord, that as we look at your word, that we will grow. And we recognize maybe in the midst of all of the teaching this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, as you can see from up there, uh, we're going to look at Psalm 144. Who knows it really well? Yep. I didn't know much about Psalm 144 and I'll, until the beginning of this year. This psalm, you're going to swear blind. I've heard chunks of this elsewhere. You're right. The basically beginning is in Psalm 18. There's bits of Psalm 39. Verses 1 to 11 basically are laced through 2 Samuel 22, when King David had been delivered from harm by God from the hands of enemies and the hand of Saul. They're all present and correct in this psalm. It's a mashup from other psalms with some additions. It's a compilation, sort of rolled into one. Why, I hear you ask. I need a hearing test, clearly. Psalms 107 to 150 are a, a, a real mixture of psalms. What you'll notice is in the book of Psalms, some of your Bibles might have it. It'll suddenly say, book of Psalms, number one. And then there's a section of Psalms, and then you suddenly go, Psalms, book of two, book three, book four. And the last lot, which is 107 to 150, are book five. They were sort of compiled, collated, selected into um, categories as such. And that's what you have. So we have book five, which really doesn't fall into a particular category. It seems to be a mixed bag going on there. And also, it's meant to reflect the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, and so forth. So there are a mixture of Psalms. And what you'll also notice is that there's a heading at the beginning of this one. It says, of David, a psalm of David, and we naturally straight away think King David, which is fine, but it doesn't always mean it's by David. It's a distinct difference. It could be about him for his use, dedicate him. It could be a collection under his name. So we would see that what they've done is they've taken bits from various David psalms, thrown them in and put them together. And these later psalms were most certainly written or at least compiled together in place after the Jewish people had been returned to Jerusalem after being in exile to Babylon. King David is long, long, long gone and long, long, long dead. And as one author, Alan, writes, Psalm 144 is unique among the royal psalms. Royal mean it's attributed to King David. Royal psalms in that it reflects... Oh, I've done it again. English word I can't pronounce. Democrat... Yes, but with an ing at the end. So it's democratic with an ing. Democratizing. Thank you. Joy was helping me out earlier on in the week. Thank you, darling. It reflects a democratic. <laughs> Say again. Democratizing. Did you get that? Thank you, that'll do. Interpretation. This was simply a tolerably different way of keeping alive the messianic hope. The community could even now live in the good of the Davidic covenant as a sort of first fruits, while it was waiting for its full restoration signaled by divine theoph Sorry, dear. Theophany, thank you. Theophany. It's unreal. I'm trying to make it simple, but when you're quoting someone, I'm a little bit, bit stuffed. I wouldn't use it myself, Denzel. I know what the word means. That's the stupid thing. I know, and I'm going to break it down for you now. What he's basically getting at is that these promises in Psalm 144 that they have taken from other psalms, 
uh, that had been written by David is sort of the promises that were meant for a lasting royal throne of David. And you can now, these returned exiles can take back those promises, sort of take them on board for themselves, transfer them as individuals and as a people, as a collective. And that is what they're doing here. And theophany, the last bit, means, if you do not know, it's a really lovely technical term, theo meaning God, and it sort of means appearance of God or demonstration of God's power. Do you understand the, that's what the, the term is used there particularly. And so what they're doing is they're taking on board those promises that they have seen them through as a community before they got exiled because they rebelled against God. God does have a problem if people rebel against him. You do get exiled out of the community. And they got exiled and they got returned knowing that they've been promised that they can be returned. And they're really taking back on those promises that were given to David. So there's a sense to me that we can take on board the promises here because we are both as individuals and as church are connected to the royal line of David via our Lord Jesus Christ who is the everlasting direct descendant and Lord of David. Read the Psalms. You can take them on board for yourself. So we're going to read Psalm 144. We're going to go through the whole lot. Um, could you just run this for a minute for me, please, to me? I want Timmy to run this for me because I don't want to be distracted by having to push a button as I read this. So, This Psalm 144 uh, has become one of my favourites. And effectively, I have almost been living it this year. So you ready? Praise the Lord, who is my rock. He trains my hands for war and gives me fingers skill for battle. He is my loving, loving? He is my loving ally and my fortress, my tower of safety, my rescuer. He is my shield and I take refuge in him. He makes the nations submit to me. O oh Lord, what are human beings that you should notice them? Mere mortals that you should think about them, for they are like a breath of air. Their days are like a passing shadow. Open the heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so they billow smoke. Hurl your lightning bolts and scatter your enemies. Shoot your arrows and confuse them. Reach down from heaven and rescue me. Rescue me from deep waters, from the power of my enemies. Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. I will sing a new song to you, O God. I will sing your praises with a ten-stringed harp. For you grant victory to kings. You rescued your servant, David, from the fatal sword. Save me! Rescue me from the power of my enemies. Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. May our sons flourish in their youth like well-nurtured plants. May our daughters be like graceful pillars carved to beautify a palace. May our barns be filled with crops of every kind. May the flocks in our fields multiply by the thousands, even tens of thousands. And may our oxen be loaded down with produce. May there be no enemy breaking through our walls, no going into captivity, no cries of alarm in our town squares. Yes, joyful are those who live like this. Joyful indeed are those whose God is the Lord. A rousing psalm. So back to verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord who is my rock. He trains my hands for war and gives my fingers skill for battle. 
He is my loving ally, my fortress, my tower of safety, my rescuer. He is my shield. I take refuge in him. He makes the nations submit to me. Some of those manuscripts actually state that he makes my people submit to me. The first two verses are a reminder of the experience of who the Lord is, his power. They're sort of designed and put there to remind the singer. By the way, you're meant to sing the Psalms, but be blessed, I won't do that. Sing, reflect, or read the Psalms that God has acted for them in the past. It's a reminder of what God is about, who God is for that person. And there's this sense of praise the Lord. You should always open up with praise the Lord. As Philippians 4 states, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Effectively, this psalm is Philippians 4, 6. Now, if you could leave up, if between us sort of flick between one and two, if you could just do that to me, I'll be grateful on and off, on and off. There are listed, in my understanding, from what I've gone through, nine descriptions of who God is. Nine. Nine one words. And I would like you ah, to read them out to me. Rock, thank you. Next. Trainer, thank you. Ally. Fortress. Whoa, 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 what? Tower, thank you. Rescuer. Shield. Refuge. One more to go. Nope. Subduer. Thank you, Denzel. Our Lord is a subduer. Yeah, you have to sort of look behind the scenes on that. But he subdues people. Think about it. We don't like the idea of our loving I like. He subdues people. What, God? Yeah. So, we're going to take just a little bit of an extension on what these actually mean. So, rock, what does that mean? What does that conjure up for you when you think of God as rock? One or two, literally two per time on this. Strength. He's like, it just um, a lot of uh, beating. <laughs> okay, thank you. One more. Foundation, did you say, Frank? Thank you, yes. For me, rock, firm foundation. Ever stood on a rock when the sea's whacking against it? Oh, you know, he ain't shifting. Well, you're praying that hope ain't shifting as long as it's down on not the West Coast. Teacher, what does that mean? One of you actually used what I would consider one of the good phrasings. Somebody already said trainer, and I like that. Now, God trains us. And another word under teacher? Seems a bit obvious, but... Sorry? Enabler? Yep, great, thank you. Love, loving ally. What does that mean? What does that mean? You think of God as your loving ally. Looking out for. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah? It's got our backs. Yeah, we'll come to some of those in a minute. Thanks, Carol. Carol's back. Um, good. Companion, I like. The idea of God is our companion. Think of that for a minute. Companion. Fortress. Sorry, hang on. I do apologize. Nothing against my sisters. Men, fortress. Come on. Thank you. Yes, he's our surrounder, our defender. Tower. What is tower? If you think of God as tower, what does that actually mean? 
Strength, yeah, there's something else that means. Something you can run into, thank you. Yeah, it makes me think of something that's higher, lifts, up, lifts us up from a situation. Lifts us up from a situation, yes, thank you. He knows what's coming. Amen. He's a watchman. It's a watchman that sees what's coming, lives in the tower. Just get that. God is a watchman in the tower. Whoa, come on, we're getting there. He sees the battle coming. Rescuer. Mm. Saves us. Saves us. One more. It's an active word. He actually goes out and rescues. A rescuer doesn't sit in his tower and wait, does he? Go, come on, run, run, run. No, he goes out and actively saves. Our God is a rescuer, an active God. When he sent his son Jesus to die, that was an active act of rescuing us from death. Shield. Mm. Armour. Protects us, yeah. Personal. There's a sense of me that he's personal. Fortress covers a load of people, but a shield is slightly smaller, and therefore it's a personal protector as well. It's both. So you can take it on board for yourself as an individual. So many people read John 3.16 and think God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for it. But that excludes me. What? So with a shield, it's personal as well. Refuge. Think, what does a refuge do? Frank. It's a safe place. Amen. It's a safe place. There's something else also that you do when you're in a refuge sometimes. Shelter. Yeah, there's something active about it. Thank you, Denzel. Restoration. In a refuge, you are restored. You are restored. It's not that you just get taken in. You get taken in damage when you're escaping. You get set back up, restored, and hopefully sent back out again. And the last one, subdue. Power, yeah. In control. He brings under control by physical force, persuasion or other means. He overcomes. That's what a subduer does. That is what our God does. We struggle with this concept sometimes, I think, of God as a subduer of people because he so loves the world, which he does. But it's not namby-pamby love. It's not like a covering up love. There are times of people, he said, that's it. Enough is enough. You need subduing. The Old Testament, I'm sorry, still rings true into the new. And Jesus, when he walked and cast out demons, was that not subduing? Okay, so when you read these, get some of it. It makes me... Oh. I read it and just went, oh, that was nice. But God made me read it for three months every day. So just hold that in your thinking for yourself. Verses three to four. O oh Lord, what are human beings that you should notice them? Mere mortals that you should think about them. For they are like a breath of air. Their days are like a passing shadow. So here we have the psalmist in one and two recognizing who God is and the power and what he is. And then you get the psalmist recognizing their own weakness, who they are not. Just interesting, isn't it? Have you ever thought of yourself as a breath of air? You're just a day passing like a shadow. In God's sight, we are but a blip within time. In one concept. 
But who in this psalmist is thinking, this is the Lord Almighty, creator, sustainer of the universe, who should give us a second thought. Can you just think about that for a moment? We are nothing, are we, compared to the eternal Lord? Nothing. But he thinks about you every moment. He considers all your prayer requests. He listens to your inner thoughts. Bad and good. He cares enough to move situations or people when necessary. He rejoices. Actually, the whole of heaven rejoices just when one person turns to him in faith. One person. Let's get that again. One person turns to him in faith. Whole of heaven rejoices. That person could be you today. When you speak to God, he doesn't look at you and go, dear mere mortal, how dare you speak to me? I am the God, I am the Lord. He goes, no. Heaven rejoices because you're chatting to me. I'm listening to you. Isn't that amazing? Just have you picked up on that? You recognize your own weakness and God says, great. I will listen to your prayer requests. You're a little mere breath of air. I'm a little mere breath of air. I am like a passing shadow to him. Yet he looks at you and notices you. His eyes are never off you. Psalm 139 says it all. If you're never sure, look at Psalm 139. Where can I go, O Lord? You knit me together in my mother's womb. From the minute you were conceived, he was working on you and looking at you. You can't go anywhere that he doesn't know. Just think about that. You, who is a mere breath of air, God cares so much, he sees every part of you. The only word I can think of when I was putting that together was awesome. I hope you're getting excited. Somewhere in here, the spirit is starting to leap a little bit. Verses five to eight. So what we have now is rejoicing, remembering who God is. And then what we now have is the psalmist then realizing that they are but mere nothing. Why should God look to me? But then he does this. Five to eight. Open the heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so they billow smoke. Hurl your lightning bolts and scatter your enemies. Shoot your arrows and confuse them. Reach down from heaven and rescue me. Rescue me from deep waters, from the power of my enemies. Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. This is the psalmist calling upon the Lord of heaven's armies to act in a situation. If you remember, I said there was a chunk of Psalm 18 was taken into these verses. And if I can give you just a moment on Psalm 18, it's not going to come up on the screen. I just want you to listen. And of course, the fact I'm already in Psalms would mean that Psalms is just a little bit further back. Just want to read from this. And this is, imagine David, remember, that uh, he's just talking about who God is. From verse 1, it says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise. He saved me from my enemies. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry to him reached his ears. 
Then the earth quaked and trembled. The foundations of the mountain shook. They quaked because of his anger. Smoke poured from his nostrils. Fierce flames leapt from his mouth. Glowing coals blazed forth from him. He opened the heavens and came down. Dark storm clouds were beneath his feet. Mounted on a mighty angelic being, he flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He shrouded himself in darkness, veiling his approach with dark rain clouds. I want you just to bear that one, verse 11 in mind. Think thick clouds shielded the brightness around him and rained down hail and burning clothes, uh, coals. And this is the bit I like the most. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded amid the hail and burning coals. I like Psalm 18 as well. That was past tense. If you read that, if you heard that, you heard a lot of past tense. And what the psalmist here in 144 is doing now is actually taking what was in Psalm 18 as a remembrance and now making it a request for that to happen again. And I just want to pick up for a minute Psalm 18 verse 11. It states that he veiled his approach. Now it could mean in some forms for me that he almost came in stealth-like. sort of came in under slightly camouflaged so that the enemy couldn't see his approach until it was too late. Just for a minute, just for a second, Satan thought he'd won with Jesus. He didn't see the back plan. He must have rejoiced when he saw Jesus dying on the cross. He thought he'd won. <laughs> Got it wrong. It was done stealthily. Funny enough, that's what happens in rescue situations. A captured person doesn't know that the rescuer is acting until they arrive, do they? So it could be like us in a situation when we're calling on God to resolve it, there's a sense that he has abandoned me. I'm not getting an answer. He's not heard my cry. Well, he has. He's just coming in camouflage. And you know when he's acted, when he acts. The imagery here, God could touch every mountain and set light to it, but it's sort of Exodus language. It's descriptive language of just really saying, God has acted. The day of the Lord has come. He has worked out his, that strange word that I can't pronounce, the off of that one. That's it. Thank you very much. Bless you. See, this is why we're church together. We help each other in our weaknesses. You could imagine that God really doesn't sort of sit there hurling lightning bolts every time a Christian needs help. That would be interesting. Well, you think about it just for a second. God, help me. Well, that'll be it. Well, there'll be every single one of us at some point will be seeing a lightning bolt virtually every three, three seconds, if not more, yeah? There'll be multiples. It is a language talking about to portray the power of God at work. I do believe, as this psalmist says, chuck your arrows in, confuse the enemies. I believe there is a sense that God does confuse our enemies. He does allow them to set their own traps. He does rout them. He does send them scattering with their own blind lies and their own blind eyes and their own anger. He does confuse the minds. I believe he does that. I have so many stories from my past job that I can't go into because it's all been recorded, but you, I've seen God at work with people who have tried to dig a knife in my back. And we have the psalmist here turning around and saying, 
Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. This is definitely the psalmist who's got some personal level problem and a dispute with people within his own court, his own assembly, maybe other nations. But they're lying. People are probably believing them, believe that they're telling the truth. And this psalmist is saying, but they're lying. They swear to tell the truth, but they're actually lying. And we have this psalmist saying, come on, Lord, reach out, rescue me. Does anybody here feel like that in their work? Like that's a rhetorical question. I do not expect raised hands. The people that swear blind, they're going to tell the truth or they will back you up or they will do this. But they end up saving their own necks and telling lies instead. Is that going to start resonating with a few people? Just sit with that just for a second in the light of this psalm. Come down and rescue me, he says. Verses 9 to 11. Because I will sing a new song to you, O God. Be grateful I will not show one. But I will sing a new song to you, O God. I will sing your praises with a ten-stringed harp. By the way, when he means harp, he doesn't mean this little diddly thing. He means a big sucker. We have one in our house. Big harp. Make a lovely noise. But I will sing a new song to you. For you grant victory to kings. You rescued your servant David from the fatal sword. Here he is sort of recognizing that what God has done for, again, he's remembering what God has done for King David. And he's now calling on that same power, that same strength that killed save David to come into his situation now and do the same and the reason you see that is in verse 11 because he then says save me save me We are heirs to the covenant promises of the Israelites. I am in charge. Come and save me, this compiler here is saying. We're now the new Israelites. Bound through the blood and the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are able to claim these actions and promise for ourselves. And again, the psalmist repeats this. Rescue me from the power of my enemies. Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. He's done it twice to emphasize the anguish that he or, I'd like to say he or she, I will do that here for this context, is going through. So, grounding it ever so slightly and a real question... What does God acting on our enemies looks like today? I'm sure some of you have prayed those prayers. Please send a lightning bolt. There's lots of giggling. That means yes. Please come and squash them. What does God acting on our enemies look like today so okay that's fantastic well do you know praise the lord not one of you has got an enemy in your life not one of you has prayed any of those prayers not one of you has seen god ever deliver you from a problem in the workplace, family, call it whatever, you name it. Carol is confessing. <laughs> exactly, it's a testimony, you can have it. Okay, it's like a confession. Well, and well, it's confession, she's had enemies. Okay, oh yeah, I've had enemies, but I didn't incite their enmity. Um, so, Oh, this is a long, long time ago. There are there, there are others, but this one comes to mind because you say in the workplace, like so, like absolutely decades and decades ago. So I was working in a 
pub at lunchtime, actually a pub not very far from here. And um, I haven't been there long, six months or something. And um, there was, um, I was a Christian, and there was a like a senior barman working there, and um, he used to, um, you know, come out with a smutty jokes and stuff like that. But listen, I'm not approved, but I don't want to engage in that. So I just used to sort of blank that. So he thought that maybe that's what got his hackles up, that I didn't, you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, anyway, so then the one day there was a manager and a manageress there uh, and a child. They'd left their place in the Midlands, sold the house or gave up the house because they obviously lived on the premises. Anyway, one day the manager called me and said, uh, called me and said, I want to chat with you. Oh, he says, um, someone, this someone, he, he said the person's name, has said that they sh you've been free pouring the the liqueurs, i.e. So, like in a pub, if you have a sh a, a, a a spirit, they're all on um, optics. But liqueurs are not on optics. You put them in a little measure like that and measure them out. So, anyway, that's how I'm like, well. And because at that time, if anyone, a customer wanted to buy me a drink, well, even now, if someone wants to buy me a drink, it's likely to be a Bailey's anyway. So Just so you know for future. <laughs> and uh, With or without ice? Uh, uh, with, 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 with. Anyway, so I said, like, that so isn't true. Um, blah, blah, blah. He said, well, I've been told that. So... That's that, you know what I mean? See you, ta-da, goodbye. Anyway, so I shared that with some members of my a house group that I was in at the time and all this and this lady said, oh, come on, let's compose a letter. Because I was like, what? It's not true, it's unfair. So I went through, I'm going to write to the brewery, you know what I mean? What We can't just go on one member's of staff word against mine, hey? Anyway, so, anyway, so, but then after all that, I said, you know what? It's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. I'm just leaving it to God. Anyway, about so the, the about three months later, so the issue must have been so that head barman he lived in. So the issue, well, uh, I'm thinking about it, was that the the pub was losing money. Someone had, had their hand in the till. Okay, so if you're free pouring drinks, it's like you're giving bigger measures than you should. So there must have been like an in-house discussion, where's this money? So this chap has decided, oh, let's look, make it look like Carol's iffy, if you know what I mean, and blah, blah, blah. So as if I was the one. But the thing was, as they made up, the, anyway, after about three months, because the pub was then, because he was the one, this head barman, who was taking money, for, 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 you know, basically out of the till. Uh, but he was trying to, you know, shift blame, look in here, there and everywhere. Anyway, and after about three months, I, I wasn't happy when I heard it, but, like, they they were um, asked to give, uh, to give up. They were chucked out of the pub, basically. But they'd given up their family home in, in the Midlands and they had a child and everything. And, yeah... And obviously, so the head, and the head barman lost his job as well. But that was, well, I thought it was a bit harsh, but what I'm saying is is they made a poor decision, you know. It, it, yeah. Thank you, Carol. No, no. Oh. It does, yeah, it does, because the problem is the head barman, whoever it was, and you're all now curious which pub it is, but, and it's Bailey's with ice, but the point is, no, and I make no lie to, I've just, but if I make a joke, you'll remember the story and it'll help you remember this psalm. The point is, actually, we, we think that we're, iso how can I put this? Our actions aren't isolated. If we do bad to someone, it's not just whoever that other person we've done it to is going to be affected. It might end up, as it's here, the head barman taking that money, then affected the whole of the family who... Granted, made 
a wrong decision and maybe should have asked some questions, but they trusted the person else that was living with them. And it is the consequences. Thank you, Wayne. It's the consequences. The Israelites, in, in their rebellion against God, had consequences, not just for them being exiled, but they stopped being a blessing to other nations. We rebel, you rebel, I rebel, I do something that's completely whatever and causes damage and it has repercussions. And then we as a church stop being a blessing to the nation. So we have to bear that in mind here. So sometimes we, we may not want to rejoice in seeing what happened. It proves the fact that we have repercussions. And yes, our enemies, by the way, half the time as Christians, our enemies are not of our making. It is the other person. And I believe for this psalmist, that was happening. If he's saying, they're going, Lord, you know, you see my every thought, you know my every move, you know everything that I'm doing, you know that I'm innocent in this. They are telling lies. Whether it's a personality clash, power trip, whatever. And we can call upon um, God in this way to come into our situations, believe it or not. Now, let's just try and quantify this ever so slightly. First and foremost, sometimes we actually have to be the mouthpiece of God to bring and challenge our enemies. Sometimes it's so easy to want to just pray and then hide. But God actually sometimes, well, you actually have to be the mouthpiece. Or you need a fellow brother or sister to be your mouthpiece for you. To actually defend and stand with you and in front of you. And I know that Jesus changed it and said, I want you to love your enemies. This love is the love for their best. Now, just hear this carefully. It is for their best. It's to bring out the best in them. Because everybody, every human being is made in the image of God. Every human being, I don't care what faith they follow, they are made in the image of God. Okay. I was explaining to the guys yesterday, you'll hear me, I will never say... Hindu man or Muslim man. I will say a man who is following currently hin Hinduism or a man who's currently following Islam because they are made in the image of God. That's first and primary. If you mark, if you label them one thing, that's how you're always going to see them. But if you label them as a, as a man or a woman who are made in the image of God, you will see the God in them. And this is what this is about. Your enemies are made in the image of God. And you want to bring the very best out of them so they become living Christians. They become your brothers and sisters. So we are called to love them. What Jesus was doing was battling against the Pharisees' rule that they took the Old Testament, love your neighbor, but they said, but hate your enemies. And he's saying, no, 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 love your enemies. It's an agape love. It's that, that highest form of love that says, I want the very best for that person. But it doesn't mean they're not corrected. It doesn't mean they're not disciplined. And God says, do not despise discipline. I discipline those whom I love. As parents, we have to discipline our children. As parents, you're going to have to discipline your child. As I said, having children's easy. It's helping them to grow is the problem. And we shouldn't rebuke that because we do that and we should as parents and we don't always get it right. But we should be doing the discipline out of love for them because we want to see the very best in them come out. Yes. And that's the same here. So with your enemies, when you are praying for them and you're asking the heavens to break out over them, you want them corrected. You do want them to be uh, disciplined. You do need correction to happen, not for revenge, not for hatred, but for agape love. And man, is it almost difficult to sit there and pray the prayer, Lord, help me love them, break out, stop them, subdue them, trap them, change them for love's sake. It's almost impossible, isn't it? But through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is possible. 
Let's admit, we want to pray those prayers. Send the lightning bolt. But we ask God to break out over them so that we may have to openly rebuke them so that they become eventually and hopefully and prayerfully all that Christ wants them to be. The part of casting people out of the community, which is what the Israelites had to do, was actually, so they basically went away and realized, they had to go and reflect. The prodigal son story is one of those key moments. He took himself out, did the runner, and it was when he was absolutely his worst and out of the community, he realized, what am I doing? I have sinned and rebelled. I need to return back. And then he came back, fully restored. And we have to do that with our enemies, our enemies who are not currently our brothers or sisters in Christ. And it is difficult teaching, I recognize. There's other teaching to deal with our brothers and sisters. Let's look at Luke chapter 17, if you want. It's actually harder on ourselves, by the way. I might as well, it wasn't in my notes, but I'm gonna go to it now quickly. Luke's in the New Testament, if I remember. Uh, it's Luke 17, verses 4, uh, th- sorry, um, I'm just going to do from 1, just to help. One day Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptations to sin, but that sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. It would be better, for a th- for, uh, a, it would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins... Rebuke that person. Then, if there is repentance, forgive. There is a distinct difference for us believers, my brothers and sisters. If we sin against each other, we are meant to repent. Then, forgive. Where is loving your enemies? It's loving those who do not know you yet or do not claim to know you yet. Do not know Jesus yet. Them you're meant to forgive. Like that. Sorry, that wasn't. Like that. Now, we do meant to practice forgiving our brothers and sisters so we don't hold bitterness and hatred in our hearts. Hear me carefully. But you see that teaching. The call upon our lives to be so much more distinct as brothers and sisters in Christ, is a higher barrier, a higher bar, I believe, than those who don't know Jesus yet. We are called to a higher standard. People will know you because of the way that you love each other. Wasn't part at all of any of my teaching. Back to Psalm 144. Verses 12 to 15. May our sons flourish in their youth like well-nurtured plants. May our daughters be graceful pillars carved to a beautify a palace. May our barns be filled with crops of every kind. May the flocks in our fields multiply by the thousands, even tens of thousands. And may our oxen be loaded down with produce. May there be no enemy breaking through our walls, no going into captivity, no cries of alarm in our town squares. Yes, joyful are those who live like this. Joyful indeed are those whom God is the Lord. Here we have the psalmist having almost... Uh, estrological purport, no, still can't do it. End time proportions of what is meant to be the absolute epitome of God now fully reigning. A time of the Lord's favor, a time of future expectation. And we've got that coming when our Lord Jesus returns. Amen? This is an element here of heaven touching earth. I think it's a marvelous image. Uh, Verse 12 is absolutely fantastic. Young men growing into God, being loving, God-loving young men. Young women being so well shaped 
by the word of God that they are able to be depended on like pillar supports in a palace. It's quite amazing imagery. The imagery is um, there is um, uh, carvings of it's females and just literally just adorning each column of a palace. And you will look at that and go, wow. And to have both young men and women being so shaped by Christ that they are absolutely something to hold up as the epitome of fantasticness of, wow, look what God can do. Look how, how their relationship is with God. Isn't that amazing? And it's interesting, I didn't think we were going to be praying for the youth today, but that gives you an example of what we're partially talking about. But our young people don't become these well nurtured and well carved people unless we do something about it plants are nurtured yes apparently nurturing involves time and effort apparently i'm not a gardener care and attention is required apparently watering is required apparently my plant in my office needs some but it my plant is 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 wilting it's actually dying at the roots because it's not getting quite the full care and attention it requires. <laughs> that is my plant in my office. That it's lost its leaves, it's lost its splendour, it is dry at the end, it is starting to die. That is the epitome look of our youth, my brothers and sisters. Unless we are willing to stand up, to lead, to guide, unless we're willing to shape them. This could be you watering our youth, our Sunday club, our creche. This could be you. The reason I'm not going to pour this in the plant now is because there's a hole in the bottom of the pot and that would not look good for the electrics. <laughs> but my point is, there are some of us here who have heard me say this now for three weeks in a row. The very fact I had to Sunday morning call out for an assistant to help Joe, who's been doing it for weeks on end, along with Bology and others, we need people to stand up. We praise and thank God that we've got a youth ministry here. There are churches that haven't. But if we keep going on at the rate we're going on, we're not going to have a youth ministry. We're not going to have the next generation to pass down. We're not going to see beautiful young men nurtured and sculpted for God. We're not going to see beautiful women being beautiful for Christ. Sculptured and willing to be depended on to be the next generation in church. Don't like being nagged? I don't like seeing God's church die. It's God's church, not ours, not mine. So unless you want our youth to end up like my plant, just do what I do. Sit in my chair and stare at it, but do nothing. The rest of this passage is for those who lack nothing. They're not so loaded up that they're hoarders. They're not recreating new and new barns to fill up their load. But these are people who are saying, do you know something? We lack nothing. And that happens, <laughs> the ultimate time happens when Jesus returns. But there is some of this where we lack nothing. We lack nothing spiritually. Um, we'd always be fed and have some food in our stomachs. But this, the psalmist recognizes, is a hope to hope for. So the conclusion in this, God is not just a safe place to hide in. He is an active master of spiritual war. He rescues, that means goes out and acts. He's a subduer of evil and evil people. Again, this is active. 
For those who are at the members meeting and now church, and you're going to hear it more and more often, the new church vision statement is reclaiming ground and restoring hope through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Reclaiming ground and restoring hope through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is active stuff. This is out there stuff. This is not just inviting somebody along to a church function. This is us getting out there and getting our hands dirty. And over the months, you're going to hear hope, new initiatives that we believe that God is calling us to do. There is risk taking. It hurts to love. It's not about hiding behind walls or screens. This church is being called to be relationally out there. We're being bold because he trains our hands for spiritual war. We are to reclaim ground. We are to bring end hope into people's lives. Not just to fix their immediate needs, which is a good thing, but we're to fix their end needs, their spiritual needs, the end times. We're not just to feed somebody food, we're to feed them Christ as well. We're not just to be mates with them, we're to make them our brothers and sisters. It's a part of me that the worldwide church in the West has turned our Lord into a money-dispensing, cuddly, sin-eating, wimpy God. He is a warrior God. He can set mountains on fire, but more importantly, he sets hearts on fire to respond to him. And he does that through his people engaging with the other people, whether they're our enemies or not. We're to battle spiritual darkness that has covered the hearts and minds of the broken the hopeless. We are commanded to go into battle with our Lord. Not just to sit here on a Sunday morning and worship him. We're to pray those bold prayers for a person who needs healing. We are to pray those bold prayers that deals with unclean spirits. We're to ask God to rend the heavens for the love of the other person. We are to speak the gospel with boldness because, as it says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I am not ashamed of the gospel. The same power that confuses the enemy can also save them. So I don't know what your situation is, and I know for some of you, it is going to have resonated that you've got some enemies in the workplace. Pray love lightning bolts upon them. Pray they will get confused, but pray also that they will come to know the love of Christ because they need their ground reclaimed for Christ. They need to have hope restored in them. Because our God is not a wimpy God. He is a warrior God who loves like a warrior. Please will you stand. And it's normally at this point we say, now take a few moments for those words to sink in, allow God to work in you. And that's true. But if you've got somebody now that you've just thought of, I want you to pray for them. Pray that they will come to know Christ. As much as you may really, really not like them right now, Recognize you are but a passing shadow as well. Pray for them.
and then go and reclaim ground and restore hope in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless to you all. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.